As human beings, we all participate in the global act of naming and being named. All of us. It was July 2, 1994. It was the end of the school term. It was the end of autumn in South Africa. It was a camp that the government used to help school children prepare for life in the army. And you had a choice. You could attend different streams or different pathways at the camp that would put you on a trajectory to end up in the army in a specific area. I chose to be put on the path that would lead to being a foot soldier because I believed that at that way I was going to be able to not to have to bear arms and I could go into the medical field of the army, which is what my dad did. And so the camp started on the very first day. We were lined up, about 300 of us, it took place at my school because the school that I attended had a, a, a dormitory that could at least host 700 students. We had a big school. And the school had 700 students on every, every day at school in a dormitory. So 300 students from all across that uh, county, you can call, came to participate in the training. And on the very first day, breakfast time, so not the evening, we slept, the next morning we wake up, it's time for breakfast, we are lined in our different pathways, and I was lucky that one of the children, one of the students who were in my school just happened to be on the same pathway, and so we were together there talking to each other. And I have come to discover over the last couple of years being here that I talk a lot, and I don't always listen enough. So if I haven't always listened to you, uh, thank you for trying to teach me to do that. And so I was talking to my friend, as is, seems to be my custom, and suddenly from in front there was a staff major, as they were called back then, who shouted out loud, Blondie! and pointed straight to me. Now, now, you might think I'm exaggerating, but there was a time when I did have long flowing blonde hair, okay? <laughs> I was tempted to put it on the screen, but then I thought of how much it will embarrass my children and my wife, so. <laughs> Blondie, he shouts, pointing straight at me. By this time, I'm still talking, oblivious to what's going on around me. And he has to shout it again. And by shouting out a second time and pointing straight at me, by now, 300 students are looking at me. And my friend says, to... and I look up. And yeah, he was pointing at me. And uh, I look back now and I wonder, if only I had this kind of hair back then. So in that moment, what that staff major didn't realize he did is he named me in front of those 300 students. He gave me a name that I did not choose and I did not want. He gave me a name that I was defined by. For that week, I was defined by my outward looks. Not that I looked very nice, it's just the hair, okay? But he defined me in a way that I did not choose to be defined, and for that week, I was known by 300 other students as Blondie. And please, please don't call me that. <laughs> you see, I'm not the only one, but each and every one of us here this morning have been called by names. Each and every one of us here this morning, at this very moment, are named. And we are living those names. So take your Bibles 
And before we go to Revelation, take a moment and join me in the story in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 5. In the book of Mark chapter 5, we find the story of a woman who had many names. For some of you, this might be a familiar story. For some of you, it might not. This is a, a shortened version. Uh, other parts of the gospel give us a little bit more information, but for this morning's purposes, Mark chapter 5 will do. And we pick the story up in verse 24. And this time we read from the New King James Version, which is also the version that you will find on the screen. But you can follow in your Bibles that are in the front of your pew. Uh, you, it doesn't matter. It says the following. So when Jesus went with him, this is the, the father who came to ask for, for, uh, for his child to be healed. And a great multitude followed him and thronged him. So Jesus is on his way. Now a certain woman, it says, verse 25, had a flow of blood. She had a period for 12 years. Sometimes the Bible uses very euphemistic ways of putting it. Let's just put it straight this morning. And had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Some translation says, touched the hem of his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So notice here that we do not know this woman's birth name. Yet we do know her by many other names. For example, according to the Jewish law in the book of Torah, the Jewish law of that time, during a woman's regular monthly period, she was considered unclean for seven days, starting from the day of her period. Anywhere she sat, anywhere she laid herself down, it was considered unclean. If anybody so much as touched her, if anybody sat where she sat, if anybody laid themselves down where she was laying down, they would be considered unclean. Every month, a woman who had a period became a risk to everybody else around her in that community. And according to the Torah, she remained in this unclean state for another, another additional day after her period ended, just to make sure and then she had to take either two turtle doves or two pigeons and present it to the high priest to declare her clean. But this woman, in our story, who chose to risk all she had or all she was to reach Jesus, never experienced that final day for 12 years. And so one of the names she was given was unclean. We also see that in Christ's time, when we think of homes, they were smaller than England's homes, which could be surprising to those of us foreigners who come from elsewhere, that there are homes smaller than these. And in those homes, the extended family would be crammed into the small room that there was, so there was no personal space, there was no privacy, little privacy. Several generations of women would be crammed together, working together from even before dawn so that they could prepare and feed the family. And as they worked, the women were able to connect. They would be able to share the, the, their feelings, they would be able to bond, they would be able to share their dreams and their hopes of life, but not this woman. Not this one. All the while, while the other women were gathered together, connecting, building relationships, 
she was confined to solitude. Twelve years. So at first, she was named by her community as unclean, and over time, the actions and words of her community came to also name her as outcast and disease. Her plight was desperate. She did not have a monthly cycle. She had a daily cycle. I mean, just think about this. Imagine how weak she must have been from all the loss of blood, the smell that surrounded her all the time, the constant washing, the changing, the isolation. There were no tampons. There were no showers down the hall. There were no indoor plumbing to flush away the blood, no washing machines or dryers to clean the soiled linens. The condition defined every second of every day of her life. Not only was she named unclean, outcast, diseased, but she also became known as unworthy. What names to carry for 12 years? What identity to have for 12 years of your life? And then there's a glimmer of hope. There's a, there's a possibility that she could be renamed. There's a glimmer of hope in her town. A man by the name of Jesus she had lear, learned, learned and heard of stories of healing. This Jesus did what doctors were unable to do. This Jesus, well, he, he made the lame to walk again. He could make blind see. So maybe, just maybe, he could heal her. And we see this hope lifting her up. And yet at the same time, this hope was mingled with frustration and helplessness. We can just imagine for a little bit how desperate she must have felt sitting in a lonely room devoted to her constant uncleanness, knowing that the laws of her, her religion and uh, prohibits her from going out onto the streets and that those laws would be jealously enforced by her own community. Imagine her thoughts, her feelings. Oh, if only I could touch him. If only... He, he, if, if only I could just reach out to him and touch him, he healed others. Surely he can heal me too. And yet, and yet what happens if I approach him and it doesn't work? I risk even greater shame and condemnation than I'm experiencing right now. Imagine the name they will then give me. But we see hope in the story. We see faith in the story. We see real hope because Jesus had been lifted up. And when Jesus is lifted up, he draws others into his presence. We see real faith because Jesus is lifted up and he draws her into his presence. Hope driven by the desire to be free from her shame, driven by the desire to be free from her names. So what's the name that you're battling with today? What are the names that you have received recently? Maybe I can also ask, what are the names you have given others recently? What are those names? Is it hypocrite? Is it liar? Is it lazy? Incompetent? Stupid? Foreigner, woman, what are those names? In fact, what's the name that you've allowed yourself to be the defining factor in life at this moment? What's your name? Within this story, we see the powerful and debilitating names that this woman had received, and yet we also see real hope and real faith because Jesus was lifted up. And because Jesus is lifted up, he draws her in, and we see, maybe at first probably awed and terrified uh, at her own audacity, she begins to formulate a plan, a plan to take her into the crowds, onto the streets of her village, along the shores of Galilee first, and foremost in almost a decade. We can only guess at the details. Maybe, 
Maybe she must have covered herself so that she could avoid being recognized by the others, slipping away from her family, because imagine the shame if they found out she was not at home in a room where she ought to be. Imagine how she moves through the crowd, presses against them, and as she presses against them, without their own knowledge, she is fouling them, causing them to become disgraced and unclean themselves, sharing that name that they've given her to them. Imagine, terrified at being exposed for the fact that she's done this to them. Did she know what she would say to Jesus when she reaches him? How would she approach him if she got near to him? Perhaps, perhaps we don't know all the details, but what we do understand is that she had put herself at a great social risk to even explain to him why she had come to him for healing. We can only guess what was going through her mind, but we don't have to guess at the steadfastness of her faith. This woman had faith. She was willing to risk absolutely everything to act on it. What is it, a spur of the moment decision to go and do it and to reach out and touch Jesus as him? We don't know, but she did. And so what we do know is that she was able to push through the crowd and she touched him. She took that risk, and when she took that risk and she touched him, she knew at once that her certainty was correct. According to scripture, her bleeding stopped immediately. She could feel within her body, it says, that she had been healed from the condition. Can you imagine the thrill that must have shot through her body? And then, to her shock and terror, Jesus stops and says, Who touched me? Now she had done it. Because in first century Palestine, culture was about honor and shame. When Jesus said, who touched me, this desperate woman knew that if she was discovered, she would disgrace not only herself, not only her family and all her relatives, but she would have disgraced the whole community. Now she would be cursed with an even more humiliating name, an even more shameful name. What would they now bestow upon her? And yet her act of courage is astounding. Let's read it. Mark chapter 5, verse 33. Notice what it says in Scripture. It says, But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. I love the fact that Mark is so particular here, or the scribes are so particular here about not just saying she told Jesus the truth, but she told him what? The whole truth. Why? Because he knows it anyway. He knows it anyway. She is fearful. But she knows he knows it anyway. If he could heal her like that, he must know her anyway. What boldness from this woman. What integrity knowing that there's a possibility that she could get a name that would isolate her forever from her community, knowing that there's the possibility that she will never be able to face that community ever again, she, in awe and gratefulness for the fact that she was healed, doesn't move away from Jesus. She doesn't go and hide in the bushes like Adam and Eve, but she moves towards Jesus. And she tells it all. Boldness, integrity, fueled by hope and faith, which are most likely the names she hoped she would always be known by. And then something, something amazing happens. Without expecting anything in return, without, without expecting anything more than, than the release of the names of the past, the shame, without expecting anything more, Jesus does something amazing. And, and Jesus could have chosen any word to speak to her. He could have chosen any sentence to speak to her. We would be reading that sentence today, and we would be at awe at that sentence. But Jesus chose a specific way of addressing this woman. In Mark 5, verse 34, it's the very first word that comes out of Jesus' mouth is daughter. Your faith has made you well. 
Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. By the way, while we were at the European Pastors Council a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Gifford Ramey preached an amazing sermon on this very phrase, go in peace. I want to invite you to go online, go look it up, go to the TED website and go look for the EPC uh, videos and go watch it. Go watch that sermon. As a community, as a community of believers, it would be wonderful if you all watch that sermon. So back to this. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Daughter, how stunning. Notice, notice, she has come to Jesus. She came to find relief from her suffering, but not only does she get healed, but Jesus also renames her. He gives her a new name. He embraces her into his family, making her not only acceptable to the community, but intimately and tenderly connecting herself with him. Daughter, a new name, a name that only Jesus could truly speak. A new name that takes away not only her illness and her isolation and her shame, a new name that also restores her to health and to the community, a new name that he calls her that draws her into family, into community, a name that Jesus is not ashamed of, a name that he bestows upon her so that it will give her new dignity, give her value, that esteems her in a society where women were considered to be private property, a name that lifts her up from the physical shame of her condition, a name that far, far more lifts her up, not just from the shame of her lack of her societal value, but lifts her up beyond the, the worth that society placed on her, and he puts her on a new path. And Jesus does all of that in the one single act of naming her, of giving her a new name. A new name. And so we come to Revelation 2, verse 17. And in this beautiful, beautiful passage, we are bestowed a promise. We are, a promise is made to humanity in Revelation 2, verse 17, by the same Jesus. This same Jesus, because the book of Revelation is about the revelation of Jesus. And so in verse two, chapter 2, verse 17, it says the following. We put it on the screen as well. Revelation 2, verse 17. He who has an ear. Most of us has ears, do we? All right. Well, my mom as a child would have content that uh, statement. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Oh, how much there is in this verse that we could expose on, but not today. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a what? A new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. A new name that defines the true you. A new name by which he desires for you to be known. And that will define who you are. And you do not need to know, uh, you do not, do not need to be a Bible study student to know as a human being that we experience in life this tension between who we are and who we can become. And we do know as Christians that, that this beautiful kingdom of the future that is there, that, that it's going to come, it's not just something that is in the future, but God desires for that kingdom to be a reality now. And so if this name that we're going to have in order to live in this beautiful new kingdom of God is something he's going to bestow on us, we have the opportunity to live that new name now and be defined by that name now. When we stand before God, just as this woman here in Mark chapter 5 stood before Jesus, he will give us a new name. In a moment of tender, inconceivable intimacy, Jesus will speak a name. The Most High God will speak a name. He will whisper a name to you and me that only he can truly give us. It's interesting to see that there is this, 
this anticipation of becoming this new person. There's this hope of becoming this future person. But sometimes the hope of that future person that we hold on can be quite daunting to us. It, it can leave us with a sense of trepidation. And we sense this in this very story of this woman, this tension between who she is and who she would love to be, the names that she has and the names that she believes she ought to have. And so this reality is often so terrifying for us, so utterly alien for us, so impossible to hold on for too long that we decide to rather put it aside and forget about it and escape to the conventions of life. And so we end up setting as our goal in life to simply be good people but not to be renamed. This means that we end up setting, we end up settling for the morality of the wider community in order to fit in, because you know, we, we don't want to be too weird. We don't want to be too different. We don't want to be too odd. We do not want to be too undesirable to the community around us. And so in this placid counterfeit of life that we find ourselves in, we find respite from all the questions that stare back at us as we look into the sky, knowing that we ought to live by the name that Jesus wants to give us. And so the norms of our world are what we become comfortable with and we allow ourselves to be named by our communities, named by our brothers and our sisters, names that are not our truest name. Like the daughter in Mark chapter five, you and I have also been named. Not only was I known as Blondie, but there were times where I was also known as selfish. There were times where I was also known as naughty, incompetent, liar, not called to the ministry. And I'm pretty sure in fact, I'm definitely sure that you have been given some of these names too, at times. And yet, when I look at Revelation 2 verse 70, and when I think of my Jesus, and I think of you, then I know that we can all live in the hope of that future name he will give us. I hope, I really hope that that day when Jesus puts that stone in my hand, that it will say, child of God. I hope that when he puts that stone in my hand and when he puts the stone in your hand, it will say, humble servant, filled with the Holy Spirit. Imagine it saying, full of grace. Yeah. What about forgiven? I live in that hope. And I believe it is possible for us to live that name now. I believe that through the power of Jesus, he's the one that gives us the name. He's the one that died on the cross for us. He's the one that resurrected. He's the one that overcame sin. He's the one that through him we are saved. He's the one that will give us the strength to live that name now. You see, it's only when, we, when our world often gets ripped apart, when we are able to see the path that we have been walking and we see the names that we've accepted that should not be the names that we have. It is only when we are awakened from these moments of sleep, when we are exposed, that we see the conventions of society that we've allowed our lives to be guided by, and the promises that society gives us are very often just illusions to what is true. And let me suggest to you that there is a greater and deeper exposure than any other element in life can provide us, and that deeper and greater exposure at which feet we should go and sit is the feet of Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
In the most intimate moment of her life, this woman who is now daughter in Mark chapter 5 is exposed and renamed. In that stark reality of that moment, she realizes that she's been living somebody else's life, a life that was now laid bare to her by the presence of Jesus Christ. And Jesus puts her on a journey, a new journey, a new name. A new name that can only be spoken by Jesus. So listen up, if I may, for just a moment, speak to you from the heart. As children of God, we are sometimes not only the recipients of names that we should not allow ourselves to be defined by. but we are also often the givers of such names. As a community of believers, you and I have an awesome yet extremely important responsibility. It is your mission. You as a community of believers have agreed to this mission, to know God and to make him known. That means that as followers of Christ, Your Christian responsibility is to help others to live that future name that they will receive from Christ in the here and now. It is our responsibility, as Paul calls us, to be ambassadors of Christ. That means that you and I have to always ask ourselves the question, what am I naming my brothers and sisters because of my actions and my words? What names are others in my community of believers, in this community of believers, receiving because of my actions and words? Not because of their actions or their words, but mine. Oh, I know. I know that you have received names that I've given you that you should not have received. I'm sorry for that. And I hope you will forgive us for that. What are the names that you have given your brother and sister? We always have to ask ourselves, do my actions and my words name my Stambra Park brothers and sisters? Do my actions and my words name my Stambra Park family the name that Christ will give them? Our life, your life, the life of the person sitting next to you, the life of the person sitting in front of you, behind you, the person whose name, birth name you know, and the person whose birth name you don't know, there are still people in you whose names I don't know. I have to apologize for that to you. But your life, their life, my life, the, our lives within this community of believers have to do both with how we lose our path and our heavenly name and how we stumble forward, ever seeking, opening scripture, being in community with each other, ever seeking, ever listening to that whispering voice of Jesus, your author, my author, your namer, my namer. You see, others others name you, but only God knows your name. So I leave with you this question. What name do you hope Jesus will call you by? My plea is that you will live in the hope of that name. My plea is that you will live that name in the here and now. And as you live that name in the here and now, let that name become you and let you be defined by that name so that in this community of believers, we are able to live for that coming where Jesus will speak us that name that he has shown us and that he has named us 
that he has defined us by, and that we are able to call each other. God bless you. Your